Hey, what's up, y'all? I know it's been... I, I know I usually lead with that saying, I know it's been a while. And, I mean, there's, there's a good reason for that. It ain't every day that, you know, I get to just sit down and, you know, come to the park and basically make, you know, a video about current events and, you know, post it on YouTube. It ain't every day I get a chance to do that. In fact, um, I had some vacation time. I took a week off. And like, I've been usually, like, I've been, lately, I've been telling people that even though I was off for a week, it was pretty much, just it was just as busy then as it would have been if I didn't take it off. Because I basically had to restock my um, fridge and freezer. But now that I do have some time off, seeing that, you know, I didn't go to the gym today. Um, I figured, I figured I'd come out here since, like I said, it's been a long time since I've come to this park. And one of the main reasons being because, um, I've, uh, I don't know if I've talked about this or told y'all, but I've, I've been setting up this, uh, home gym, which, you know, so for the most part, I'll just be working out there. So another, um, like I said, lame excuse to not, you know, come out here like I used to. But anywho, um, I thought I would do a, um, make this film, or make this video rather, about, uh, a duet in death of two um of two pieces of shit who have you know due to the fame that they've acquired and the legacy they left behind are indeed American icons who've recently died and what this mean I mean what that means to me and what that really means to us or at least what it should mean now that the now that they didn't gone and um now that they gone and um went home to be with their daddy the devil with their father the devil <coughs> and that being no more than um Carolyn Bryant and um Jerry Springer now y'all remember um surely y'all remember what I had said you know the last time I made a video about um the, the series of videos that I made about um Gangsta Boo and what I said about her and other members of um three six triple six that who are dead and the legacy they left behind surely y'all remember what I said when I said that uh, that I don't have a heaven or a hell to put these people in but based based on the li the livelihood the lifestyle that they led we don't have to look too far we don't have to look too far and uh, to determine whether or not um, whether or not heaven became their home. And I never, I never went in on it. I, I admit, I had meant to, but I never, I never went in on um, the late Queen Elizabeth, who, um, who kicked the bucket last year, and how all these members of Commonwealth were basically in uproar and grief and mourning about that useless piece of shit.
but I do remember saying that you know we don't have to look too far as far as figuring out you know where um, you know where her final destination pretty much was and same here with a Carolyn Bryant and a Jerry Springer now I think I'm gonna go in first on Carolyn Bryant because I, I do find it ironic that within this time span it for all I know it probably happened within the same week it it would seem so because within the same week I've I've stumbled across I've come to the knowledge of both Carolyn Bryant and um, Jerry Springer recently passing away and as far as Carolyn Bryant you know I wasn't even aware that a lot of us probably weren't either that you know we weren't even up to par as far as whether or not she was even still alive because it's almost like for the past shit when when did it happen 1954 so what that make that for the past what pretty much I mean pretty much 70 years she's been MIA nowhere to be seen or found except somewhere down in uh, Louisiana some motherfucking where it ain't like you know it ain't like she's made an icon of herself in the same lore that uh Jerry Springer has you know making a career out of you know basically smut and the lowest common denominator of American society coming to his show to <clears throat> like make, make complete fools of themselves But, uh, how I even came to the knowledge of who Carolyn Bryant was and what she did was pretty much this series called Eyes on the Prize. And this, and mind you now, this, this was the 90s. This was like the mid to maybe late 90s that, um, I got a hold of these um, of this series long before there was a YouTube, long before there was the the level of um, you know mainstream media that you know we know of it today. In fact, the internet was just starting to um, you know come into fruition, like you know with ninety five and ninety six. So it was then and it was through um, a series like Eyes on the Prize that I first learned. And, you know, I probably I want to say I learned about the story in school. Because, you know, the story of Emmett Till was always one that was very controversial, needless to say. So I'm willing to bet that, you know, what really brought me into the um, to the full realization of what happened as far as the story of Emmett Till was indeed um, eyes on the prize because you know the mainstream media has always filtered um, fucked up stories and fucked up incidents that occurred in this country so they were very so I mean of the um, the few stories that they were willing to tell as far as what happened because they weren't going to tell us about, they didn't tell us about Black Wall Street. They didn't tell us about the, um, I believe, the, what, the Chicago riots of 1919? Or was it 1929? You know, my, my history escapes me. My dates escape me. There you go, y'all. Those are the loud sounds of Denver. That's on the daily. 
sirens, whether it's police or fire, just wailing all over the place. And air, yeah, ambulance too. Let's not forget ambulance. But uh, so yeah, it it was pretty much um eyes on the prize that brought me to the conclusion of that incident. As well as, um, you know, Martin Luther King. But, you know, with me coming from Memphis, we already had that info. Uh, needless to say, obviously, obviously we had that info. That was something that was a direct correlation to, you know, Memphis history versus, you know, what happened down in um, Money, Mississippi some 14, 15 years prior. Because, you know any respectable uh, Memphian surely has been to the uh, Civil Rights Museum at least once where you know you got to see all that and you know you learn more than just you know you know all the fucked up shit that happened during the Civil Rights Movement in Memphis you I mean a lot a lot of that stuff really uh, you know detail what happened um, really in Alabama a lot of it like with the uh, a lot of this stuff was, um, for, as far as what I remember, what happened down in, um, like in Selma. But what I didn't know, now that I'm on that tangent, little did I know, little did I know, up until I uh, watched uh, one of Umar Johnson's, uh, and you know, even with him being the shine that he is, you know, you have sometimes you have to take the message, leave the messenger. As long as he's promoting or telling you the the message as far as what really happened, because in a place like the Civil Rights Museum, think about how fucked up this is. As a native Memphian, not knowing this because you've basically been lied to. Because most of us were told that the assassin of Martin Luther King was James Earl Ray, right? And I believe they executed him like in the early 2000s. What they didn't tell us, and up until 2023, I did not know this, was that it was actually, it was actually a sniper from the Memphis Police Department. Whereas James Earl Ray was just supposed to have been the fallback guy. We didn't know that. We didn't know that. It's and it's one of those things that, you know, you, you would be gaslit into you know, you would be gaslit into me as far as being told that you're supposed to know that, but how how could you when everyone's telling you that it was James Earl Ray? And you don't think nothing about it. Why would you why would you investigate any further, especially turning your attention towards MPD? I mean, so it's, it's real crazy. It's real crazy. But back to uh, Carolyn Bryant. Right. And the, the story of Emmett Till and the, the in numerous stories that I've heard since, you know, from from the time that I saw it up until now. As far as the incident down in Money, Mississippi, where there was this boy from Chicago who came down to Money, Mississippi to visit his family. And, you know, with him being from Chicago and not really knowing the the rules and regulations of the Jim Crow in the heat of the Jim Crow South. Goes down there and from what sources have stated, whistled at a lily white woman. By which uh, some good old boys down there caught up to him and basically beat him to death and tried to drown him in a uh, with a um, with a boat or like with a um, or a boat engine rather. So I, I saw the footage. I saw. And I mean, mind you now, at a very young age, I could, I must have been 11 when I saw this shit. 
like the aftermath of what he looked like when you know his mother decided to do an open casket you know seeing his decomposed body and like I said how she made an effort to make it open casket the funeral open casket so that the stench would permeate all throughout the entire city as I was told it did And then uh, later on, I heard stories that, you know, it wasn't so much that he whistled at her, you know, not in a flirtatious way, but apparently, apparently he had, later on, because, you know, at face value, because, you know, with immigrants coming here, they'd probably hear the story of Emmett Till, and they would probably try to find a way to based off what little information whether they know it or not because knowing where we stand with a lot of them they would have been like well well you know with being in the height and in the heat of the jim crow south he should have known better whether he was from the north or the south to be up here calling himself whistling at a white woman is particularly a southern white woman right he should have known better than that See, I grew up due to the misinformation that was given to me, thinking that. I grew up thinking that. What the hell was he doing whistling at a white woman in the first place? In the height of the Jim Crow South. I imagine he probably wouldn't have been able to get away with that. And what we now know and understand and understand as the Jim Crow North. Because that's another thing, you know, growing up down South, they didn't tell us that. They didn't tell us that the Jim Crow that there was just as much of a Jim Crow North in New Jersey as much as it was down in Mississippi. Or any other part of the South. But apparently, from what I later on gathered, was that Emmett Till apparently had a, uh, a speech impediment. That it was a speech impediment that um, that kind of caused him to basically whistle or you know blow like a little bit of a, blow like a whistle or, or something like that and that he basically from what I'm gathering that he greeted her and while and I think he like nodded you know like you know how um like nodded his head or his hat at Carolyn and upon doing it and walking out the store that they were in he whistled at her and then later on I hear um about Emmett Till's father, how his father, yeah, his father was in the uh, the Second War, the Second World War, down in Italy, and how you know he had a he had a thing for um, how he was pretty much basically a white woman chasing basically, and messed around and even killed one of them while he was in Italy, and you know um, it was either. It was either the Italian government or the U.S. Army who basically executed them. As he was basically um, breathing fresh life into the um, stereotypes that were made out about um, that you saw in the original Birth of a Nation. I mean, they could have made live footage of that just to solidify their points about this Negro and his um, insatiable lust for white women. 
and while that may be true or false depending on which negro you talking about or dealing with um they could have confirmed that with him because like i said he was out there in italy you know rather than focusing on um winning the war so that you know he could go back home or he was over there just he was over there just having um trying to do the hanky panky with like i said with some italian women and again later on it was only later on much later on i mean like i'm well into my 30s when i'm hearing about the these stories about like i said mlk going over to sweden you know in his uh sexual escapades where he's basically chasing a swedish woman down some banquet hall basically butt ass naked from what i either half either half naked or butt ass naked Man, i can see it right now oh astrid oh oh ingrid oh come on now ingrid you know you want some of this good loving now And you know, I say all that to say that don't, don't, because you know, they, you know, and it's, it's with that understanding that, you know, I can understand why the late David Carroll would, um, in a lot of his videos would have pictures of MLK and he would have the pictures of them, um, hanging upside down because for quite some time some people and it you know it it finally came across us because you know we we saw the um we saw how they were heralded we saw the children's books you know of us coming up and we saw the children's stories like anim animations of you know what was going on during the jim crow south and how you know martin luther king was just heralded as this shining example of uh, racial justice for you know for not just african americans but you know for races of all people who eventually just came in and took advantage of the uh the the 1965 immigration act and uh i i have yet i have yet to be personally thanked for these people coming in if anything i've been uh I've experienced I'm pretty sure what most other African Americans have experienced despite like I said we being the generation who allowed these fuckers to come in here but yeah you know we we know them to be shines that that's my whole point but again back to Carolyn Bryant and how I feel about the incident now that I mean my whole life well not my whole life but the vast majority of my life like I I held that to um, the story of Emmett Till. I held that in my heart as far as being what this country, you know. And it wasn't until later, you know, growing up, I would learn many other fucked up stories about this country and what it's done. Things that, you know, the media makes an effort to not expose. Like I said, they they've just given us increments by which to go so for the longest but so yeah i did know like i said i knew about mlk and i knew about emmett till so <clears throat> the story of emmett till was definitely a story that i held near and dear to me as an african-american male having personally been accused by a, a, a becky of something quite similar that could have, you know, in the right setting, could have had me swinging off a tree, have me being some strange fruit. Cause I think I'm sure y'all, those for my uh, one, for my first days, for my uh, day ones, rather, excuse me, for my day ones, y'all, y'all know the story about me. How, like I said, when I was at Atlanta Bread Company, how. And like I said, I didn't initiate this conversation. It was them folks talking about, ironically enough, Columbine. And I say ironically enough because I'm in the city where Columbine happened. And it's it's been um, nine days since the, uh, what, is it, what did it make that? The, shit, what, the 24th anniversary since that bullshit happened? Yeah. 
And the reason why I remember that is because I know they specifically did that on Hitler's birthday, which is April 20th. So that ain't a hard date to remember. But, uh, so they were talking about Columbine and how fucked up it was. And I specifically remember saying, I can only imagine what kind of trouble I would be in if I brought a gun to school. So the next day I come in and like I said, you got one of these, um, some French piece of shit or French American at the least probably couldn't speak a word of French to save a motherfucking life and next thing I know our boss ironically enough coming from Louisiana coming from that gene pool because you know a lot of people say that the worst white man is um one from Texas I I'm like I'm not really sure about that and if he if he is he must be he must be kin to um his cousins next door to in uh, Louisiana because I would say the worst one is are the ones from between Mississippi and like that border between Mississippi and Louisiana and these are the folks saying that like I, I never heard of that before I mean, it was my brother who told me like they said that the worst white man is um the ones from Texas and I yeah I've heard some stories I heard about the story about Jasper Texas I'm not gonna go into it but we know about that but I'm pretty sure we're talking about I'm pretty I would not be surprised if I mean the fact that Texas and Louisiana are next door to each other it's it's pretty much the same thing like whether you're Texan Louisiana same 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 gene stock what's the difference different states different regions well not even really different regions same gene pool anyway so like I said I come in the next day my manager is up here telling me that this lying sack of shit said that I was thinking about bringing a gun to school now again and I asked I've asked for years how is it that someone who was a valedictorian had been member of, had been a member of several honor societies can confuse and convolute imagining what kind of trouble you would be in if you brought a gun to school in contrast to thinking about bringing a gun to school and since then all these countless mass shootings school shootings whose perpetrators look nothing like me make that make sense so I, I say that I say all that to say I've always had, I like to think, I've always had my head on the swivel. Having, having seen and heard and read the story of Emmett Till in numerous times. And having experienced a similar experience that Emmett Till got um, myself. The only difference is, I live to tell my story. I managed to live to tell my story. I'm still alive to tell my story. Because just imagine where I would have been had it been a different scene, had it been a different time period where I so much as blow my nose the wrong direction, I so much as slip over a banana peel and say, uh, say you know my trousers ain't as tight and um you know I slip and do a whole I do a whole um 360 in the air and fall on my butt and you know a little bit of not even so much as my dingling but a little bit of my pubes are showing she all she would have to do was say uh I was over there flashing my um uh, my Johnson at her and next and, and I, it, no questioning no like 
no nothing. Next thing you know, I'm I'm becoming what Billy Holiday referred to as strange fruit. That's what I'm saying, man. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't be like imagine being in them times. And I honestly don't know which would be worse. The gym like the antebellum you know, antebellum slavery in the South or the Jim Crow South. Where after the fact that slavery was abolished, Negroes pretty much had to be freaking terrorized and basically had to walk on eggshells. Because, like I said, God forbid, God forbid, you know, as a black man, you so much as slip on a banana peel. In the presence of um, a southern belle. And she uses that. To fabricate a lie. So that you know. Just to get you killed. Just so that you know. Because she just felt like. She was just because she just felt like. She was in a pick a ninny mood. She just felt like picking a ninny. Something that she probably would have done. Anyway. Whether you was there to, uh, whether you were there to, you know, slip on a banana peel, or you just walked by and, I said, greeted her and, um, nodded at her with, you know, you tapping your, uh, tapping your, uh, you know, that, those hats that they used to wear and saying, uh, good day, ma'am. I mean, we know the story of Rosewood, where she, I mean, that lady down in Florida was uh, basically cheating on her, uh, cheating on her husband, and her husband found out and beat the brakes off of her, and rather than throwing him under the bus, she basically said two wildebeest Negroes came and um, raped her. So yeah, I couldn't imagine being in a in a society in a time where my very life hung regardless of what level of bullshit it was, the very thread of my life, my very life hanged or hung at the um at the line lips and words of a southern belle. Cause honestly, you know, now that now that um Carolyn Bryan has finally died and gone home to be with her father, the devil, um, I honestly can say that you know, with me doing what I got to do, and with me not even really being aware of whether or not she was alive and not really giving a flying fuck about it, I mean, I can honestly say I really I feel nothing about it. Like, and I really don't see it ain't really much to celebrate when you consider that you know with the rise of Karens with the rise of future Karens who are in their prime now so they're pretty much Beckys I wouldn't necessarily call them Karens now but they're future Karens you know the, it ain't really nothing to celebrate I mean, it ain't nothing to be sad about. Of course not. In fact, I like to think the only reason why she lived to be 88 years old was so that, um, I like to think the reason why she lived such a very, like, a, re a really long life is because, um, The, I like to think because the ministers of hell were basically taking this sweet precious time pre preparing a place for her down there and like I said instead of taking her out and letting justice do its thing like giving her like nah they're like nah with this one we're, we're just gonna let her live out her life because when she, but when she gets down here 
<laughs> when she gets down there, boy. When she gets down here, after she didn't lived her little sweet, um, when she didn't lived out her, she didn't lived out her natural life, getting out here and after um having did what she did in the name of W.S. and um and having a system pretty much protecting her, you know, having her as a protected class. I heard that she had some. I heard that she had some piece of shit uh, children that she didn't raise. So after she didn't did all that and did motherhood and like no, we we gonna leave her alone. We gonna leave her alone. But when she come down here, when she finally give up the ghost and come down here, boy. Mm, yeah. So I like to think that's why. Uh, she lived such a long life. She lived longer than my grandmother, about three years. So I re I really feel, I really can't say I feel anything. Like I'm not jumping for joy that she's dead, but you don't see me, and you damn sure don't see me grieving, because I'm like, okay, well, because the way I the way I see it, I'm like, okay, she's dead. She's in the lake of fire. That's all well and good. Good riddance okay but as black folk we st we still got this thing called ws we got to deal with we got a whole we got a whole nation of carolyn bryant's like i said we've heard of stories that where they've done worse and if you don't believe me there's a book called the delectable negro where they was pretty much cannibalizing our asses part of the part of the historical picnic i.e piccaninny was to do that so that you just find some random negro mind you more often times than not after church of all times after having a sunday service to pick a ninny and either hang him or string him up roast him alive and then and then eat the son of a bitch So really, I mean, when you look at the demonic history of this country, really, and maybe this is the reason why, you know, I, I'm not so, I'm not so naive to think that, oh, good riddance that, you know, Carolyn Bryant, Carolyn Bryant was lightweight compared to, that's what I'm saying, they, they allow Carolyn Bryant, the story of Carolyn Bryant and Emmett Till to be told to us, because that's lightweight compared to, to what we know about this country now. That's lightweight. What about that, um, I can't remember her name, but what about that, that female slave owner down in Louisiana, her name was Madam, um, Madam something, Madam something, I, I, I forget it, but she owned this plantation down in Louisiana, and she was pretty much doing these mad science, yeah, mad science experiments on her slaves, and it was so, it was so bizarre and so rare and so uh, so utterly fucked up that even fellow her fellow slave um owners you know members of her so-called aristocracy if you will even they made an effort to shut that shit down that that was the level of just how demonic it was So compared, compared to the real story that we know, um, Carolyn Bryant was lightweight, and that, that's not the, that's definitely not to undermine what happened to um, Emmett Till, because Emmett Till was um, just one of many black boys who never got justice for. The crimes committed against them because I, I specifically remember even earlier than that like in the 30s there was this boy in um, I believe in Arkansas who was about the same age but this was like in the 30s not in the 50s I believe where they just they just randomly basically kidnapped his ass accused them of 
committing murder on a white woman and they pretty much they either um it was either he either got the electric chair or the gas chamber they either electrocuted or they gassed them I mean just some random 14 year old 13 14 year old boy with little to no evidence accused them and charged them with the murder of a white woman and then just put them to death So I, I think I'm going to say everything I need to say about um, Carolyn Bryant because I, I think I've come to my my um, coup d'etat, if you will, about that, that, you know, with her out of the picture, what about, what about all these other, whom, what about all these other Carolyn Bryants, who ironically enough, you know, Carolyn isn't too terribly far from Karen you know Carolyn Karen it's probably who's to say it probably where it comes from I mean it's a it's a very strange it's a very strange it's very strangely synom synonymous you know it's very strange just how synonymous Carolyn is to Karen considering what we know Karen's to do because what's the first thing we find Karen's doing being abrasive using um foul language using racial racially abusive language and what do they do after that accuse you of doing something whether or not it's criminal it's inconvenient for her and then her whipping out the phone calling 911